Good early afternoon. My name is Mario Berry and my co-presenter is Marion Burkhart, as the slide says there. I'm getting a lot of feedback. Okay, hello, is that a little better? Okay. All right, thank you. Mario Berry, Marion Burkhart. Hopefully you are here to um, discuss with us and hear a little bit about strategic planning, governance, as well as project portfolio management. Everybody in the right place? All right, Nate is helping us make sure that we, we have a good sound quality and things of that nature. So with that, Mary and I also, we really like to know who we're speaking with and talking to. So by a show of hands, could I see the IT professionals that are in the room? Almost a complete makeup. Other administrators? Okay. How about faculty? Three. All on the same row. Welcome. Hey. Any staff? Please on being in four. Okay. Welcome again. Mary, go ahead and progress that. Well, from Lone Star Community College System. Just a little bit about Lone Star, what is not necessarily up on the slide. We are a community college system in the state of Texas, and we are located in the northwest suburb of the great city of Houston. Marion and myself are part of the Office of Technology Services. That is the IT department for Lone Star College, and we provide the central level of support and services for all of the campuses, centers, as well as some of our global institutions across the, uh, the country and the world. Depends how many people actually bet on horses. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. So recently we, we had another opportunity for the Triple Crown, right? Anybody know who that horse was, what that horse was, name is? Go ahead. California what? Chrome. California Chrome. But we're not here to talk about California Chrome, as you know or don't know. Did not make it. Did not happen. But anybody who picked all three horses, first, second, and third, actually won a lot of money and, and had a trifecta. But what we're here to talk about is a, a trifecta from another standpoint, from another focus and position. When you think about strategic planning, governance, and project portfolio management, often we think that they are mutually exclusive, that you can have one or none and now have one, two, or three. What we believe and what we have found from our experience and our exposure through the years that we've been partnering at Lone Star and from our other background, we believe that you need all three for you to truly be successful. Now, that means you may not be in the same maturity level for all of them, but you at least need to have all three happening somewhat at the same time. So we now have identified who you are in the room now we're also, hopefully, many of you have mobile devices. And so we actually want to get a little bit more information from you in regards to strategic planning, governance, and portfolio management. So, Marion, oh, it failed. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Because we have more people in here than the building is going to handle. Okay. Show of hands, and we will uh, okay. we'll do this the old-fashioned way. In terms of project management, where are you in the maturity cycle? So are you reactive? Show of hands for reactive and project management. 
survive. Okay. In terms of, uh, are you basic? So this is, you've got some process, you've got some project specific alignment, okay? Thirty-seven. How about you would characterize your process as effective? So standard processes, you're aligned to the organization, your transparency is opaque. Sixteen. Best practice. Two. Transformative. You are a game changer at this point. Okay. One. One. All right, let's do the same thing with strategic planning. So you are, your, your organization is at the reactive stage in terms of, sorry, in terms of IT strategic planning. IT strategic planning. Okay, basic? Zero. Yeah, zero. Four, five, six, seven. Sixteen. Effective. How many of you would characterize it as effective? Thirty-two. Best practice? Five. Transformative. Okay, zero. last one, zero, governance, reactive, ad hoc, no process, no alignment, okay, zero or one, did I see a hand? He's kind of no, he's on the fence, okay, okay, so let's go with basic. Okay, effective. Is that a late hand? Twenty six. <laughs> Best practice. Five, six. Okay, and transformative. Last one. Okay, zero. I'll let Vanna White put up our. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is probably pretty indicative, I think. I, I was at an EDUCAUSE leadership program last week, and. Um, we did something similar. And I think a lot of us in higher ed are in sort of that middle space. So it was sad to hear from some of my colleagues who were, you know, they were at that very most fundamental, just ad hoc, nothing was really working, they're decentralized, they're struggling. Um, it was sad to hear about their stories, but unfortunately, you know, they were, they were in the minority. And most of us, I think, are somewhere in that middle space. So being in that middle space, again, as I've already mentioned, many of us think of them as mutually exclusive processes, methodologies, uh, practices, right? Now, it, who all in here was at the keynote speaker session this morning? Show of hands. You know, as I was sitting there listening to Dr. Freeman Robowski, I was thinking, man, he's about to steal my presentation. <laughs> he saw my slide deck because it is quite interesting, and I'm going to fold that into, he focused on relationships and partnerships and um, making the connection and sourcing. And he mentioned all of the, almost all of the EDUCAUSE top 10 issues, right? So every institution, you may not have 90,000 plus students, but I think he, he made a reference to you could be a, 
institution of 5,000 or 20,000, and you basically face some of, of and all of the same types of challenges. Now, when you do, when you set up in your minds and in your groups, you're focusing on the vision. And all of the groups, there's an IT, hopefully, some type of component. But to create an IT strategic plan, you first must have and or know your institutional strategic plan. So as you think about all of the items, student success, access, mobilization, cloud, risk management, security, the list goes on and on. As an IT leader, you must start to anticipate what needs to be on the strategic plan from an IT perspective so that you can become a, a, a true partner. You must start to think about governance, who is actually going to make the decisions and when you're going to actually do some things. And then as you think about project portfolio management, it gets more down to how you're going to do it and who specifically is going to do it. Go ahead and advance that for me, Marion. Many of IT groups in our departments sometimes fail to realize and think about how all of those three items work to address the same things. And I think that if we think holistically about each one, you will see where it impacts and how they are all integrated into what we are doing and what you should be doing if you're going to help be a transformational leader and or department within your organization. So strategic planning. Every three to four to five years, an institution looks at potentially what they want to do. And you come up with that. An IT department, you're supposed to try to align. You've heard many of the stories of you need to be a part, you need to be integrated, you need to make sure that you know what the institution is doing. And I think, again, Dr. Freeman Rabowski talked about knowing what your business's challenges are, right? Then he's talked about relationships. I am here to tell you, and Marion is here to further reinforce later on in our presentation, that governance, and he mentioned shared governance. Governance is all truly about relationships. Everyone within your institution that has a stake, or at least everyone should have a stake, in what is going on and deciding from your strategic plan when you're going to do things. Because there are a lot of things that come into play, cost, money, resources. We're going to talk about that a little bit later as well. But then as you get ready to do that, if you recall back on the previous slide, you have a state of design and then an actual implementation. So project management, project portfolio management is that next step. It's the actual implementation. It's the doing. I think he mentioned it in his presentation. It's the actual doing what it is you have planned and when you plan on doing it, right? Okay, I got it. So I'm going to start talking specifics. Um, one reason why we wanted to do the little, um, can you hear me okay? Um, one of the reasons why we wanted to do the, uh, the survey is to get an idea of where you all are. Um, I'll just hold it. I'm fine. Um, where everybody is in terms of their maturity. And like I said, you know, I think around the country, most of us are finding ourselves somewhere in that, that middle space. Um, at Lone Star, we're actually moving, and I, I, I'm incredulous as I tell you this, but we're actually moving out of effective and into best practice, and in some cases, um, I can see, okay, it's not here, we're not there yet, but I can see transformative. I can see where we're headed in the next three to five years. Um, in terms of strategic planning, we, uh, these are the sort of high level points that we wanna, want you to take, go away with. Um, probably the most important on strategic planning is outside in thinking. So we uh, engaged Gartner and I don't work for Gartner, but I love Gartner. Um, we engaged Gartner to help us with our IT strategic planning. And um, one of the things that they taught us was language about outside in thinking. So faculty who are in the room, you'll appreciate this. Um, they continually reminded us, you need to think with the 
outside the, the instructor's hat, the student's hat, the business office hat, uh, the student services hat, take off your IT hat, put on that other hat when you think about IT projects and how you align them. And I've worked in higher ed for 20 years. Mario, I think we figured out between our leadership department, it was like 200 plus years. So we've been in higher ed for a long time. We think that we know how to think outside in. And I challenge you, we don't. Okay, we don't. So we constantly stop and ask ourselves, why are we upgrading our wireless network? And if we have our technical services folks in the room, they'll say all kinds of things like coverage and saturation and those technical uh, reasons why it is that we want to improve the service, but they don't really talk about what does this mean to our students. Well, that means that they are able to connect to our wireless network at the furthest reaches of the system. We've got six campuses, 13 satellite centers, and lots and lots of parking lots, and um, they're able to connect their mobile devices to our wireless network, and they're able to check their course schedule. They're able to, um, in some cases, take their exams on our desire to learn, learning management system. Um, so we're constantly pushing ourselves to say, what does this mean to our students? What does this mean to our faculty? What does this mean to our staff and administrators? In terms of governance, um, I'll talk a little bit about the structure of it, but I, I guess the, the thing that we learned the most, uh, especially um, in conversations regarding um, IT projects and IT spend, is working into our vocabulary. And this is one of those takeaways. Okay, so write this down. This is what you're going to take away. You're going to say this at your campus or your university, is we can do this or we can do that but we cannot do both. Uh, I don't know about your organization, but ours thinks that there is a, a, money, a, a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow that, and part of this is we reinforce it, right? Because when our, our, our hoo-hahs are called our executive council. So when our executive council com comes up with some great idea that they wanna do, and the budget's set, and all of a sudden they find money for it, there's money at the end of the rainbow which reinforces the idea that, wow, we just need to come up with a great idea and you'll fund it. It doesn't have to be part of the budget. It doesn't have to be part of planning. Right, I see heads shaking in agreement with that. So um, one of the things that you have to continually reaffirm is we can do this or we can do that, but we cannot do both because we either don't have the money or we don't have the people to do it. In terms of project portfolio management, um, we, last time we did this presentation, we were sort of, you know, in the growing pains. We had, I'll go over the history a little bit, but we had implemented um, ServiceNow's project management module. How many of you use ServiceNow? Okay, again, I don't work for ServiceNow. It is a great product. We're able to do a lot with it. Um, I highly recommend if you're looking at an ITSM tool that you look at, you consider ServiceNow. Um, so we already were using it for our ticketing system and for change management, and we needed something uh, to use for project management. And so we, we went down that path, and we've been quite successful. Over the summer, we've actually made some additional improvements, which I'll talk about briefly. And um, those three things together, if if I don't communicate anything else this morning, it's this one nugget of truth. It doesn't really matter where you are in terms of these three aspects of IT. If you can move, I'm so sorry, if you can move incrementally through this maturity cycle, so if you're only in basic in terms of project management, but you're, you're getting pretty far along in terms of governance and strategic planning, there are things that you can do to just make those incremental improvements. Because once you do, once you start to see this thing that we've called the trifecta effect, you really can see the horizon and where you can go as an organization by maturing in all three of those areas. So a, a little anecdote to that. 
and a small disclaimer. So many IT groups think logically, many personnel within the IT shop think logically, you do this first, you do this, and then you do this. Now, we started this from that perspective. We initially only had a, a strategic plan. Then we decided for particularly our ERP and our student information system, we now need a governance group because we did not have all of the money at the end of the rainbow and we needed to identify what we could do and what we couldn't do because we actually had a project list of death. Anybody know about that project list? It never ends. It, nothing ever falls off. And anybody that ever submitted something, just because it's on that list, they believe that it is going to be done, right? And so we have to begin to condition and or recondition and set a certain level of expectation. So that's what Marion was specifically saying, well, we can do this or we can do that. And sometimes we may end up being able to do both, but it's setting that certain level of expectation is that it begins with the communication. So logical thinkers, you have a strategic plan, then you need to get to the governance, then you need to get to the action. Similar again to Freeman Robowski. Go ahead. So, as Mario said, um, Lone Star did its strategic plan in 2012. So it was a three-year plan, 2012 to 2015. We're actually going to be coming up on a new uh, uh, institutional strategic plan in the next year. So once we had the institutional strategic plan, then IT took that and we embarked on our own IT strategic planning. And uh, what we did is we engaged Gartner and we used, they have templates. And so we used their templates to create a series of documents that created an IT strategy and a tactical plan and the, um, the IT strategic plan. And we had a great consultant named Mary Magliano. And she was fantastic. She, she continually pushed us to think about the outside in thinking and to um, develop our IT strategic plan in ways that really aligned with the organization and would move our organization forward um, along with the institution. We did something a little differently. Um, you know, you always do the obligatory SWOT analysis. Um, I think if you don't do it, people think that you haven't engaged in strategic planning. I personally don't really like SWOTs that much. I don't think, I think it comes from an inherently negative kind of perspective and it doesn't really give us what we want, but it lets you check off the box. So um, we did that, but we also did something new that, um, well, new to us. Uh, it's actually been around since like the 50s um, and the military uses it, it's called scenario planning. And so what we did is we engaged a very skilled facilitator in scenario planning methodology and she walked us through the, the process, and it's basically this. She read everything there was to know about, um, about Lone Star. She um, interviewed our leadership team, our CIO, and she came up with four alternate realities. Based, it was grounded in reality, but it was a future that was maybe three years, five years. Um, it could be as much as 10 years down the road. And she came up with these four different alternate futures. And what we did is we um, went to each of our six campuses and we have a technology advisory council established at each. And it's a cross section of faculty, staff, administrators, and we've also got students but they weren't included in this particular group. So we interviewed them about these different future scenarios and we got their feedback and said okay, of these four scenarios, what do we have to do in order to get there? Um, I'll give you some examples of the scenarios. Lone Star, three years ago, Jakarta? Yeah. All right, so about three years ago, we have a very, very um, uh, innovative, progressive chancellor. And he, uh, as part of looking globally, um, moved us in the direction of opening a campus in Jakarta, Indonesia. So Jane, our facilitator, took that information and said, okay, one particular future that you all might have is Lone Star now has a number of global campuses. And in fact, that looked like that was the direction that we were gonna go, because we had one in Vietnam, 
and we're still looking at um, campuses in other places of the world, which I will remain unnamed for right now. And um, so she said, you guys are going to be, you're going to have more of a global footprint. And so then we had these discussions with everybody, and it was, okay, what do we have to do in order to get there? And it wasn't just about IT. It was also, well, what are we going to do about faculty? How are we going to get staff over there? How are we going to, the time difference, actually Jakarta is kind of killing us on some things, because they're exactly 12 hours ahead of us. And so it's totally changed our change management and our maintenance windows and when we can do things and how we communicate. So that was one of the future scenarios. And we took all of that information from the four alternate futures and we came up with this loose roadmap. And the idea behind scenario planning is as you start to see some of these happen, you, you've got a plan to react to those. All right, so it's not like you're committed to one future over the others. You, you're doing the activities that you've identified that you need to um, complete in order to follow those features, no matter which one happens. And that has been very successful. Um, I, I would recommend that you look into that. You, can, you could do it on your own. We, we didn't feel confident at the time, since it was so new, um, of doing it on our own. But I would highly recommend that to you. We also. Um, like I said, we, we did interviews with um, our executive council, with our president, sorry, executive council is comprised of our chancellor, our vice chancellors, and we've got, I don't know, four or five of them, and then our six campus presidents. So these are, this is the governing body of Lone Star College. And so we did interviews with them on what are your plans, where, where are you headed? Um, we also, of course, took our institutional strategic plan and every campus so the system office we've got 10 goals the system office have objectives under those 10 goals every campus took those 10 goals and they developed objectives under those 10 how many of you are from a large organization raise your hand okay does this sound familiar familiar to you you've got we're so inclusive and that's how we make decisions and that's awesome, except then we get these lists. And I believe that we had actually, what, 172 touch points from all of these um, IT strategic objectives that we were supposed to do to facilitate the organizational strategic plan that we had to incorporate into our own IT plan. Going forward, I can tell you this, my uh, preference is to try to shrink that, to continue to help the organization, to keep it simple, to not go down a road where we have 172 touch points, but instead focus on, you know, a few things instead of 10,000 things. So from then, from that point, what we specifically had to do is then go back and then re-engage. Go ahead and go forward. We had to re-engage. Go ahead. Go ahead. of goals or touch points? Wow, good question. I will say that the answer that I'm going to give you today is it truly depends on your organization and your culture. If your culture is comfortable with having 10 to 15, maybe even 20 goals, and that is what you have been successful in doing, by all means. However, I have heard people talk and very intelligent individuals, a, a president from uh, Georgia State um, spoke in regards to having a solid mission and or vision, but only four to five true goals. And he believed that by doing that, by keeping them, as Marion mentioned, keeping them simple, but only having those four to five, you were able to effectively communicate that from the top down everyone fully understands it, can embrace it, and then can actually regurgitate it and know where they fit in and what they are actually doing to achieve those goals. But I would say you have two different mindsets on that. Come see us in about a year because um, <laughs> we actually got a new chancellor. So the, the progressive, innovative one who led us to Jakarta, he's retiring and we've got a new one and I think he's going to be more open. He's, he's been with Lone Star for 30 years. 
so he, he's, he's very well known, well respected, well liked, well loved. Um, and I, I think he's going to be receptive to the idea of maybe shrinking our focus, which is what all of us would love to see happen. And um, so see, it's been about a year, because I, I think that if we have any influence in, in that regard, that um, we will see it reducing our focus, focus very strategically and deliberately on things, knock them out, move on, knock them out, move on, because it's, it's plagued us. There are some things that we've not been able to accomplish because we just tried to attack the world and didn't work. So in attacking the world or taking over the world, as our CIO says, you still have to have people to do so, and everyone needs to be on board. So as we went out to the campuses and we got all those 172, Marion and myself and the CIO, specifically Marion and myself, we sat down and we had our own type of um, theory, thoughts, ideas, threw everything up on a whiteboard and said, what really goes on at Lone Star? Truly. Take, and we took an assessment of our chaos. You all have chaos, so I'm not saying anything bad about my institution. We felt like we needed to better organize our chaos. And the way that we previously managed our governance was similar to the way that we managed our strategic planning. Everybody could just throw everything all together and then you come up with what is called gumbo in the South. Some people like gumbo, but some people like gumbo with chicken, sausage, snake, whatever. So, but we felt we needed to determine what our gumbo really needed to look like so that we were gonna be able to be successful. So let's talk about that process. Yeah, so we used user groups. Um, we haven't mentioned, but we went through about five years ago, we replaced our ERP. How many of you have replaced your ERP? Go, live through that. Okay, it's very painful. We, um, we replaced our data tell colleague system with Oracle's PeopleSoft. It was the largest footprint of Oracle, where's Dan? It, it was the largest footprint of um, PeopleSoft in higher ed. I think it still is, as far as I know. Um, we did it in a record 18 months. So for those of you who have lived through it, you understand how completely crazy that is. But we had to do it. There were a lot of organizational uh, objectives that we couldn't meet unless we did that. All right, so typically you'll organize your ERP around user groups. And you've got user groups who are comprised of subject matter experts and their ideas come up, they bubble up, and then you've got, you go through some sort of a decision-making process about what project should we work on. And we had that when we implemented PeopleSoft and it didn't work. And um, we could both see, Mario and I could both see that we were headed down the same path that led to that list of death that we had under our previous ERP. And we didn't want to do that. And so we, we had about a three hour conversation one day on the phone where we just, we just pushed each other and said, that's not gonna work. Well, how about this? Well, that's not gonna work. And we, we really tailored what we have now in terms of governance to Lone Star. So is it a best practice? No, it's not. Because a best practice in governance is not that you have 40 plus people on your governance committee, but it works for Lone Star for right now. And the reason why is because at each one of our campuses, remember we have six, we have three flavors of vice president. Vice president of student success, vice president of instruction, and vice president of um, administration money. And every one of those people reports directly to a president and they are charged with the operations at that campus. They're the decision makers. They're the ones who, if you want to do something and you want to do it system-wide, you have to make sure they're on your team. So we included all of the vice presidents, okay, so three times six is 18. Plus, we've got um, two associate vice chancellors, me, another executive director over our technical services group, our CIO. We've got, I don't know, maybe six or seven in IT that needed to sit on that governance group. And then we also have associate vice chancellors who are at a system level. Oh, yeah, by the way, none of this campus stuff, none of the campus administration rolls up, okay? So you've got a president, vice presidents, the president reports to the chancellor, none of the others, they all report to the president. All working. <laughs> all working under the same student information system and ERP system. 
Okay, so start, I, I'm seeing heads nod, you, you're, you recognize your institution in this framework. So is it a best practice? No, it's not, but it works for us. So one takeaway, please write this down, take it home, is you need to create, if your governance isn't quite working, consult best practices, you know, talk to people, see what works for them, but understand at the end of the day, you have to create something that's gonna work for your organization. One of the things that Mario built in to governance is the understanding that we have executives who go to conferences, who talk to colleagues, who go to the legislature, they come back and they have these great ideas. And they say, make it happen. That's where that golden pot of money comes. And we needed a governance structure that allowed for that. Because the one thing that we knew we couldn't do is have this list that was set in stone that when our chancellor came back and said, oh, hey, by the way, we're going to China. That we, we, we'd say, oh, I'm sorry, chancellor, we're not going to China because we've got this list of five, 10 projects that we're working on and your project, mm, not on there. Okay, so we knew that we could not do that. We needed a process that was fluid and that would work. So. Um, what, again, take away what works for us doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for you. Craft something that will work for your organization, your politics, and your culture. But that also matches with your budgeting, your other planning process, and has truly the key people that make the decisions. Ultimately, our subject matter experts really did not make the decisions. They didn't, and they do not. Who really makes the decisions in your organization? They really need to be a part of your governance. And you have to, and what we're going through now is you have to truly educate them on what they're making decisions on. So as an IT department, you're not only the leaders of the technology, you also have to educate and or train and inform so that the people that are making those decisions are making informed decisions. There was a question. You know, maybe I think that's a good segue into okay. the, the next slide. Absolutely. So the question, I believe, was what mechanisms and or tools do you use to gain consensus? Or it, what, what is it, how do you get that consensus? And, and so my initial answer again at this current time is you don't necessarily get consensus if you use data because then the data actually helps you make the decision. So with our project portfolio management, by utilizing SNOW and how we have matured, is that first we began with what are all of the projects in a central location where everybody could see them. There was some cost that we associated with that and we, we would just provide that, right? But as we learned quickly, that still wasn't enough. So because you still, as Marion mentioned, we still had a lot of information and a lot of requests coming from many different areas. So just because you say you have a governance group, that doesn't mean everybody's going to follow that process. So you're going you're to still have to, have to deal with those one-offs or those ten-offs. But if you begin the methodical process of educating and reinforcing what you're saying, it's that clear, consistent message. You have to start that within your own group and ensure that everyone is following the same methodology and practice. So when somebody else steps or, or presents something to you, you have something to then fall back on. So go ahead and talk about the so project management yeah, aspect. I would, I would say two-prong two attack on that is one, communication, and two, project management. So mature your project management as much as you can because it gives insight into the projects. It shows you know, how many people you have in order to work on projects, how much money that you've got. And so when they say, well, you know, what about all this and this and this and this, you're like, where do you get the money? Where, how can we do this? Um, as I said, we use ServiceNow. We used it for our ticketing system and for change management. And we looked at Microsoft Project Server and we've looked at other tools. And frankly, they, they're, they're all kind of the same. The difference for us was the tie-in 
with the ticketing system and with change management and the fact that our people already knew how to use the system. So ServiceNow lets you create workflows and behind the scenes for approvals. So what we did was we created a very, very simple form. So faculty, staff, and administrators can submit their project request. And the way, we don't have a slide of this, but we tied our governance to our budget planning cycle. And um, it basically starts, our fiscal year starts September 1st, ends August 31st, and our budget planning starts in like February. And then it kind of goes through the spring time, then it gets finalized over the summer. And so what we did was we said, all right, you can submit your projects pretty much at any time. But we're, we're going to evaluate those in concert with our budget planning process. So if you've got a great project idea um, and it's not in this year's budget, then it's going to go into the hopper with all of the other project ideas and it's going to be vetted. So it goes through this form. Keep it really simple. You don't want your customers to have to learn all kinds of technical specifications. You just want it, get it into the system. And then what we do is we hand it off to the appropriate team on, in IT. So we hand it off to our server team to figure out if, we've, if we need storage in the cloud. We hand it off to our ERP team to find out do we need consultants, do we need um, how many developers in-house do we have that are available, what does it involve. Um, oh yeah, by the way, um, our ERP is not customized. It is mostly plain vanilla and that, that saves us an incredible amount of money and it helps immensely with those projects where they just want to tweak this but it's a customization and we're able to say, I'm sorry, but unless it's regulatory, unless we have to do it, we ain't doing it. And that is, that's been huge for us in the ERP, if you can get there. All right, so information goes in, it gets vetted with the appropriate team, we come back and we say, this is what the project is going to cost. And because we're system-wide and the ERP is, is, is a shared resource, we have to have consensus. And um, we make sure that the appropriate workforces and councils are engaged in that discussion process. So they understand, hey, we're talking about it, making a change to how you build classes in the ERP system so that we can create learning communities. And this is a real issue with us. Um, one of our campuses creates learning communities a particular way in our ERP system, and they say it is the only way. It's the best way, it's the only way, and the other five campuses, you guys are wrong, okay? So we have to get that group, the, the vice presidents of student success and the vice presidents of instruction to agree. And frankly, if they don't agree, that project doesn't go forward. And that was a conversation that Mario and I had with the governance group in April. And we said, look, this project has started and stalled five times. And the reason why is because you guys can't agree as to whether or not we're going to institute a model for building learning communities. And they understood in the grand scheme of things, if they did not agree, their project was not going forward, it wasn't going to be funded, and it was going off the list. So one key to, to uh, sidestepping the list of death is make sure that when you've got your projects that come in each year, if they are not approved, they're not approved for funding, or for what, however you all define it. We define it a little, we define it according to the Lone Star way. Um, that you do not keep it on the list. It's gone. If that is a good idea, then they could submit it next year. But don't give the expectation that that great idea, because it wasn't funded, is going to stay on the list. Because that's how you get a list of, you know. The list of death. The list of death. So it is actually 1207, and we know that we stand in front of you in lunch. So <laughs> we have kind of talked a little bit about everything that is on this particular slide. Okay. So we're going to speed forward just a bit. What I would like to say about this particular slide is, in strategic planning, in governance, and in project management, all of those items need to be thought about. If you make your governance a part of your budgeting, a part of your strategic planning, all of these things that are up there on that screen right now will come into play. Again, they are not mutually exclusive. 
as you're thinking about strategic planning, think about those things. As you're thinking about project management, think about those things. When you're thinking about governance, make sure that they have all of that information. And as Marion has already alluded to, we began this maybe three to four years ago, particularly our, our governance. We changed it. It didn't work. It didn't fit. Strategic planning it was very historic, um, somewhat archaic. We brought in scenario planning. The thing that I'm trying to emphasize here to give it to Mary to, to wrap up is we truly believe in continuous improvement. We are not perfect. We don't believe anyone is. But we also believe that your culture truly helps dictate and determine how you move forward and if you are able to move forward. But you add other things, again, like Dr. Robowski said, that are possibly innovative. And then the challenge is, is how do you define that innovation? If you've never done something before, that could be innovative. If you do it differently than somebody else does it, that could be innovative. Mary? So I'll leave you with this. Um, if, you can, if you can get to the point where you're, you're, you're effective and now you're starting to, to tweak it to do that continuous improvement, I can tell you from where we sit now, because we're, we're sort of in this sphere right now, um, I can see as we're making these incremental improvements, I can see a future that's very different than what we have today. I can see business owners who are engaged. I can see where um, we are hand, walking hand in hand with faculty and with students and we are um, being innovative, however you want to define innovative, in ways that we couldn't beforehand. And that's because we're more mature in our project management, we're more mature in our governance, we're more mature in our strategic planning, and every incremental improvement each, in each one of those areas has this exponential effect on the overall system. And I'll give you one example is we've got business owners who when we moved to the new ERP system it was very different. We were on Data Tells Colleague. It's very different. It was super customized. We built. We took Data Colleague and we built it on top of it. And so um, when we couldn't run payroll, it was an IT issue, not a payroll issue. And um, when we moved to PeopleSoft, all of a sudden now we've got people who, they were very hands off in terms of their ownership of the ERP system and now they had to own it. They had, and it's been, it, Mario has had a Herculean effort in front of him to try to get our business owners to take ownership. And there are lots of reasons why people don't want to take ownership of a tech system. We're starting to see that ownership now. We're starting to see a partnership through project management where we're all talking about these projects and they understand we can do this or we can do that, but we can't do both. And so we're having conversations around, well, where do you see us in 18 months? Where, what's the legislature doing? Um, where do we need to be in terms of student success and how can we get there? And so we're having conversations now that we've never been able to have because we're more mature in project management, we're more mature in governance, and we're more mature in strategic planning. And a lot of that, we really didn't hit on it much, but a lot of that is communication. And it's not always the IT department that communicates it. So I would say our measure of success has been as much as we've communicated and educated the business owners and the other departments, they talk to each other about so that they know how and when things are coming up on their side and they work together. Again, in the world of Oracle PeopleSoft, bundles and all of that and patches, they work together to manage the resources because we do not have an infinite amount of resources, but they all work together to schedule when they're going to do their part, knowing basically on what we've provided and shared from our portfolio management and our governance perspective. There was a question, and we're basically we'll at the questions right yeah, now. Yeah, and I understand Absolutely. people need to go. If you to need go, to leave. You there was a question here in the stay. front.
one one thing is um, we're going to undergo uh, another IT strategic plan in about a year and a half. We're going to start it. So I see us involving the um, the decision makers and those business owners in uh, a more intimate kind of way. So they're more involved in helping us craft that IT strategic plan versus us kind of interpreting it using the scenario planning. So I, I see us again, kind of incrementally improving to the point where, you know, now we've got a strategic plan that we're not talking about. Now it's our business owners are talking about it, which we don't have right now. Correct. And, yes. and what I tried to, what I um, tried to mention is with our governance group, within that governance group, those different departments talk to each other to work and try to schedule certain things to happen and when they're going to happen. It's not the IT department. One department. of the best things that we did just this last year, as I mentioned, Oracle PeopleSoft, is we developed an annual bundle patching plan that the business owners and the departments came up with. And they took their turn of when they were going to do them, regardless of when Oracle released them, looking at the resources per their schedule, per their business challenges, when would they have resources available, knowing what we have as far as a resource constraint, they helped us create our first yeah. true annual bundle plan. And they, they told us when they wanted to do it, and they worked together to devise that strategy. So, so one thing that takeaway, okay, if you're not doing this yet, if you, can, if you can get agreement on bundles or upgrades or patches or whatever it is you're talking about, and you can annualize that, you can put that on some sort of an annual calendar, that will take you leap steps above where you are now because one you can communicate it otherwise it's kind of ad hoc it's kind of reactive right the other is if you've got to have area staff in the functional areas help you then they can start to plan around it so this is easy this is a very simple easy thing for you to do that will have a huge impact if you're able to accomplish it so and i would encourage you where you can annualize everything so I've got the ERP trainers that report to me. We talk to the business owners and say, all right, what kind of training do, do we know we need um, on a recurring, annualized kind of basis? So we build sections for our course catalog um, according to a schedule. So guess what? We've timed training now to go along with that calendar. So if you can do that, that will have a big impact on, um, on communication, on um, your business owners and your subject matter experts and everybody getting behind you on what you're doing and it will increase their knowledge of what it is you're doing and you snuck it in and they didn't even know it. So the last uh, statement that Mary just made, um, you were real slick and getting that it through and in. One of our campus presidents said that. So what we did, it, it, truly, is we went, Marion and myself, we went out and visited every president's cabinet. cabinet. And we sat down and we had a face-to-face, one-on-one conversation. We exposed ourselves. We were very naked, if you will, and transparent. We said, here are our real challenges with trying to do what you all want us to do. Here is what we believe could help you by you helping us. So the president, sitting in front of all the vice presidents that he had, said that. He said, you guys are very smart. You're going to make the vice presidents at every campus accountable and responsible, and you're going to use us <laughs> to do it. Because they, the presidents, are a part of the EC, the executive council. So when decisions come through, come up, they can be comfortable and know that their campus business, business makers were a part of that decision. And we also did that before we went to the campuses. We did it at the system level. We spoke to all of the associate vice chancellors and all the business departments and said, here is what we're thinking. So even though we had that three, three and a half hour session, we didn't just keep it to ourselves and then just give it to everybody and say, this is what we're doing. We went out, we made that one-on-one -on -one relationship contact, 
and then we engaged them. And as I mentioned, that one president said exactly what me and Mary really want to do. You want all of this? You're going to own it. And we're going to make your president tell you that you're going to be a part. You know, another thing that you can think of is in terms of strategic planning, project management, and governance, at any point, if you're changing anything, use that as the excuse to introduce this new thing, whatever it is. And so we use strategic planning to introduce governance. And we used um, governance to introduce project management. That's the logical step. And then we're getting ready over the core, again, come back next year because we're going to be doing um, uh, portfolio project management. So now we're going to start looking at all the projects as a whole instead of them kind of individually. And we're going to say, okay, this is what we're able to do as a whole, all of us, again, getting our business owners to start talking the IT talk versus us doing it all. And so if you can come up with some ways, um, some events, some triggers, to, something to introduce it, then that gives you the opportunity to go talk to your stakeholders and say, hey, here's the new thing that we're doing. And here's how, here's how it looks, what you're, you know, build around that opportunities to collaboratively develop it. I mean, that's the other thing is we didn't just go develop this and go, go on our little round robin and say, hey, here's what we're doing. Everybody was involved and we were constantly saying, remember when we were here in April and we, we talked about this and well, here's the report of what we found and here's how we're taking it and we're establishing governance using the information that we found. Does this work for you? Does this work for you? Does this seem to work? We are centralized. centralized. So our CIO sits on the executive council, and he has a seat at the table. So we are centralized. And centralization has helped tremendously. We weren't always centralized. And so um, being centralized helped a lot. Particularly for our ERP and our student information system. Because she had mentioned colleague, yeah. and she said we, we customized colleague, and she said we recreated colleague. We actually recreated colleague six times. Because every campus yeah. did a process differently. What else? We're here to help be a Sacagawea guide. You know, we've made every mistake that you can make. And we're what still is, making them. We're still making them, but we're, we're actually seeing a lot of progress. We thank you for sitting here and, and, and staying to the end. Appreciate it. Um, again, we're here. If you've got any other follow-up questions, and of course, our contact information is out on campus technology. Thank you. Thank you.